Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Friday, July 31st. Uh, today is the day in the LCMS when we commemorate the life of Joseph of Arimathea. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts, and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine the stock that your right hand planted, and for the Son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the Son of Man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And our New Testament reading tonight is from the book of Acts, chapter 25, picking up where we left off two days ago. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face, and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus, who was dead but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that, after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is Article 26 uh, in the uh, uh, Article 26 on the distinction of meats. Uh, funny title for a section, but it'll become apparent why they called it that. But this is about things that are neither commanded nor forbidden, uh, which we call adiaphora, a uh, Greek word meaning uh, indifferent things. Article 26, The Distinction of Meats. 
Not only the people, but also those teaching in the churches have generally been persuaded to believe in making distinctions between meats and similar human traditions. They believe these are useful works for merit and grace and are able to make satisfaction for sins. From this, there developed the view that new ceremonies, new orders, new holy days, and new fastings were instituted daily. Teachers in the church required these works as a necessary service to merit grace. They greatly terrified people's consciences when they left any of these things out. Because of this viewpoint, the church has suffered great damage. First, the chief part of the gospel, the doctrine of grace and of the righteousness of faith, has been obscured by this view. The gospel should stand out as the most prominent teaching in the church in order that Christ's merit may be well known and faith, which believes that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, be exalted far above works. Therefore, Paul also lays the greatest stress on this article, putting aside the law and human traditions in order to show that Christian righteousness is something other than such works. Romans 14.17 Christian righteousness is the faith that believes that sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake, but this doctrine of Paul has been almost completely smothered by traditions, which have produced the opinion that we must merit grace and righteousness by making distinctions in meats and several similar services. When repentance was taught, there was no mention made of faith. Only works of satisfaction were set forth, and no repentance seemed to stand entirely on these works. And so repentance seem to stand entirely on these works. Second, these traditions have hindered God's commandments because traditions were placed far above God's commandments. Christianity was thought to stand wholly on the observance of certain holy days, rites, fasts, and vestments. These observances won the exalted title of the spiritual life and the perfect life. Meanwhile, God's commandments, according to each one's vocation or calling, were without honor. These works include a father raising his children, a mother bearing children, a prince concerning the commonwealth, these were considered to be worldly and thus imperfect works, far below the glittering observances of the church. This error greatly tormented people with devout consciences. They grieved that they were held in an imperfect state of life, as in marriage, in the office of ruler or in other civil services. They admired the monks and others like them. They falsely thought that these people's observances were more acceptable to God. Third, Traditions brought great danger to consciences. It was impossible to keep all traditions, and yet people considered these observances to be necessary acts of worship. Gerson writes that many fell into despair and that some even took their own lives because they felt that they were not able to satisfy the traditions. All the while, they had never heard about the consoling righteousness of faith and grace. We see that the academics and theologians gather the tradition and seek ways to relieve and ease consciences. They do not free consciences enough, but sometimes entangle them even more. The schools and sermons have been so occupied with gathering these traditions that they do not even have enough leisure time to touch scripture. They do not pursue the far more useful doctrine of faith, the cross, hope, the dignity of secular affairs, and consolation for severely tested consciences. Therefore, Gerson and some other theologians have complained sadly that because of all this striving and after traditions, they were prevented from giving attention to a better kind of doctrine. Augustine forbids that people's consciences should be burdened. He prudently advises Januarius that he must know that they are to be observed as things neither commanded by God nor forbidden, for such are his words. Therefore, our teachers must not be regarded as having taken up this matter rashly or from hatred of the bishops, as some falsely suspect. There was a great need to warn the churches of these errors that arose from misunderstanding the traditions. The gospel compels us to insist on the doctrine of grace and the righteousness of faith in the churches. This cannot be understood if people think that they merit grace by observances of their own choice. So our churches have taught that we cannot merit grace or be justified by observing human traditions. We must not think that such observances are necessary acts of worship. Here we add testimonies of Scripture. Christ defends the apostles who have not observed the usual tradition, Matthew 15, 3. This had to do with a matter that was not unlawful, but rather neither commanded or forbidden. It was similar to the purifications of the law. He said in Matthew 15, 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Therefore, he does not require a useless human service. Shortly after, he adds, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, 
This defies, uh, defiles a person, Matthew 15, 11. So also Paul in Romans 14, 7, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in Colossians 2, 16, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a Sabbath. And again, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Colossians 2, 20 and 21. Peter says, Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Acts 15, 10 to 11. Here, Peter forbids burdening consciences with many rights, either from Moses or others. In 1 Timothy 4, 1-3, Paul calls the prohibition of meats a teaching of demons. It is contrary to the gospel to institute or do such works, thinking that we merit grace through them, or as though Christianity could not exist without such service of God. Our adversaries object by accusing our teachers of being against discipline and the subduing of the flesh. Just the opposite is true, as can be learned from our teachers' writings. They have always taught that Christians are to bear the cross, Matthew 16, 24, by enduring afflictions. This is genuine and, severe, and sincere subduing of the flesh, 1 Peter 2, 11, to be crucified with Christ through various afflictions. Furthermore, they teach that every Christian ought to train and subdue himself with bodily restraints or bodily exercises and labors. Then neither overindulgence nor laziness may tempt him to sin. But they do not teach that we may merit grace or make satisfaction for sins by such exercises. Such outward discipline ought to be taught at all times, not only on a few set days. Christ commands, Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. Luke 21.34 Also in Matthew 17.21 This kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Paul also says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, 1 Corinthians 9.27. Here he clearly shows that he was keeping his body under control, not to merit forgiveness of sins by that discipline, but to keep his body in subjection and prepared for spiritual things, for carrying out the duties of his calling. Therefore, we do not condemn fasting in itself, Isaiah 58.3-7, but the traditions that require certain days and certain meats with peril of conscience as though such works were a necessary service. Nevertheless, we keep many traditions that are leading to good order, 1 Corinthians 14.40, in the Church, such as the order of Scripture lessons in the Mass and the Chief Holy Days. At the same time, we warn people that such observances do not justify us before God, and that it is not sinful if we omit such things without causing offense. The Fathers knew of such freedom in human ceremonies. In the East, they kept Easter at another time than at Rome, when the Romans accused the Eastern Church of schism, they were told by others that such practices do not need to be the same any, everywhere. Irenaeus says, Diversity concerning fasting does not destroy the harmony of faith. Pope Gregory says that such diversity does not violate the unity of the Church. In the Tripartite History Book 9, many examples of different rites are gathered, and the following statement is made. It was not the mind of the apostles to enact rules concerning holy days, but to preach godliness and a holy life. On Monday, we will continue with the Augsburg Confession, uh, Article 27, Monastic Vows. And that is also a fairly long one. That will be the only one we do. And again, today is the day we commemorate Joseph of Arimathea. This Joseph, mentioned in all four Gospels, came from a small village called Arimathea in the hill country of Judea. He was a respected member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council in Jerusalem. He was presumably wealthy since he owned his own unused tomb in a garden not far from the site of Jesus' crucifixion. Joseph, a man waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went to Pontius Pilate after the death of Jesus and asked for Jesus' body. Along with Nicodemus, Joseph removed the body and placed it in the tomb. Their public devotion contrasted greatly to the fearfulness of the disciples who had abandoned Jesus. And we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourselves into the hand of those who loved you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin you were counted a sinner, and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit, so that you could pay our debts and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Merciful God, your servant Joseph of Arimathea prepared the body of our Lord and Savior for burial with reverence and godly fear, and laid him in his own tomb. As we follow the example of Joseph, grant to us, your faithful people, that same grace and courage to love and serve Jesus with sincere devotion all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.